How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. Kumi Naidu's path to being an internationally renowned activist started early. At the age of 15, he organized school boycotts against the apartheid educational system in South Africa, which made him a target of the security police. The situation became so dangerous that Naidu fled to live in exile in the UK. He later earned a Rhodes Scholarship and went on to lead Greenpeace International and then Amnesty International. What can Naidu's lifetime of activism tell us about addressing climate disruption and social justice at the same time? Kumi Naidu, today on Climate One. I want to begin by asking you about Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny died in a Russian gulag recently. Take me to that moment where you heard that news, how you felt, how you reacted when you heard that Navalny, many people think he was killed in a penal colony. It brought back lots of memories of people that I had lost in prison and in exile, killed through repression during the struggle against apartheid. And mostly it reminded me about what his message of his life was communicating, like we have seen with many people across the world over history. And what he was saying in his life was the struggle for justice is a marathon and not a sprint. And that sometimes ordinary people are called upon to make extraordinary choices. He had a choice after they tried to poison him not to go back to Russia. He chose to go back. And if you look at our class of politicians today, across the world, in this country included, they don't come anywhere near Navalny in terms of having any sense of integrity and any sense of being able to put their lives on the line and do that which is right. And of course, I understand your former president made a comparison with his court cases with that of Navalny. And I just want to say we should highly, highly disassociate ourselves with any comparison between Donald Trump and Alexei Navalny. You grew up in apartheid South Africa. Um, you talk about personal price. Were you willing to give your life to anti-apartheid cause? Was there a time when you thought you might give your life to anti-apartheid? All the time, basically. We got involved, you know, at the age of 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I like to tell the story because at the front of the march, our slogan was, we want equality, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the younger kids at the back of the march, they were chanting, we want a color TV, we want a color TV. <laughs> <laughs> Truth be said, though, we wanted equality and a color TV almost equally. <laughs> <laughs> and both appeared equally unattainable, right? But many of us in that generation of activists, we lived on the basis that we could be killed anytime. Mm -hmm. Because we used to go to funerals every other weekend, right? And at those funerals, people get killed, and it was a cycle, mm. right? And so when I was fleeing South Africa into exile, my best friend, uh, Lenny says to me, what's the biggest sacrifice we can make for the cause of justice? And I say to him, giving our life. And then he says that's the wrong answer. He says, it's not giving your life, but giving the rest of your life. Right? And at, and at, at 22, he was like way ahead. He was the only person amongst us who got the intersection between racial justice and environmental justice. In fact, I jokingly say at that time he probably was one of only 5,000 voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so we, you know, we, sh we shrugged and yeah. cried and we went in different directions. Two years later, a year that Lenny had been brutally murdered by the apartheid regime with three other young women from my home city. There were so many bullets in his body. His parents were not able to recognize him at the mortuary. Mm. And, um, and I had to think deeply about that distinction between giving your life versus giving the rest of your life. 
we have to shift our young people from any logic about you should die for your country. We need to shift people that you should live for your country. You should live with purpose, both for your country and the world. Apartheid had human faces, you know, F.W. de Klerk, and there, there were villains, and there was a system, and there was, you know, the police. You know, climate can feel so abstract, especially compared to civil and, and human rights. And so how does addressing climate require different tactics and thinking than, you know, the regime of F.W. de Klerk? Let's say when I was doing human rights work, right, and you're dealing with the issue of torture. With torture, you can take a person who survived torture and they might have scars on their bodies, and you can take a photograph and you can communicate that. Or if somebody is homeless, you can you know, capture the reality. The reality to show exactly what climate change is is not that easy. And say for us in Africa, even though we have contributed least to the problem, we are paying the first and most brutal price, right? And for us, the manifestation of climate impacts is not like typhoons and hurricanes and tornadoes that you have here. You know, things that is a massive media moment when it happens. It's right? slow moving, desertification moves slowly. Exactly, it's yeah. drought and desertification, which is one of the biggest impacts of climate change. Parts of our continent are becoming completely depopulated, but it's hard to make the, you know, the connection to climate change as easily. And the thing about the other challenge we have with climate change is it's not in, yeah, in absolutely an immediate way every single day. It can be there if you're following the news in different parts of the world, but if people live in a particular community, like we come from Durban, right? And two years ago, on two days, we lost 500 people like that through a massive storm like flooding wow. like we've never seen before. Hundreds of billions in, in, in uh, rands of uh, infrastructure damage. Barely made the news here. Of course, yeah. of course. And, and, and right now, you know, I don't even get surprised when lives are lost in the global south that the global north just doesn't register it because it's just become the norm. We fight against it. We want people in the global north to understand that we are, our lives are no less uh, you know, cheaper than your lives are. But I just would end this point by saying, you know, when we say global north and global south, please understand what we are saying is that the overwhelming global majority in the global south and the minority in the global north. Right? Understand, look at the numbers that we are talking about. So we have a deeply undemocratic world, and that is probably one of the main reasons why we're not making progress on climate. Let's talk about intersectionality as it relates to getting more people involved. And you created a graphic that shows four quadrants, four paths for different categories for how people can get involved on climate justice. So tell us about the different pathways. And people don't think they have power when it comes to climate because it's so big. I talk to a lot of powerful people who run the U.S. Navy, the state of California. They're like, hey, I can't, you know, I can't really put a dent in this. It's hard. Okay, this is the most important question for me, right? Because... Our starting point of activism, those of us who say we need to change things, we start with a mentality about how people are oppressed, repressed, excluded, marginalized, and so on. And what has happened over time, unwittingly, is we have actually come to think that people have much less agency than they actually, notwithstanding all those injustices that people have absorbed, that they have, right? And what is needed for us to remind ourselves about the power that people have, the different kinds of power that people have. People have tremendous powers as citizens and voters, as enforcers of transparency and accountability, as litigators. You know, even in the red state of Wyoming recently, right, young people were able to take a court case and actually win a court case showing that the federal government was betraying. Yeah, I think it was Montana, but I know you're British. Oh, so, geography's sorry. not so good it, for it you. Is, I know that. It, yeah. it, it was yeah. Montana. I've made this mistake before. I want to just say that the second uh, area, which is harnessing our creative participation, and this is where I consider climate activism has made its biggest, biggest error, right? And that is we have tried to shift people into action 
by science, facts, figures, policies, and proposals. Everything aimed at the head, and we have ignored the heart. Now, I hate to say this, but Steve Bannon and Donald Trump actually get it. They get that you move people, not by facts, figures, and so on. And I'm not saying we need to do what they are doing, where they actually falsify the facts and talk outright lies and create alternative realities. We can stick to the facts, but we can communicate the facts in hopefully less of a boring way than we currently do it. Right? We have to learn to move people. And, and, and so, yeah, it's about harnessing our arts and culture and, and, and so on. And I'll quickly just say that harnessing our wealth is a critically important thing. We have more power in terms of wealth, even amongst poor people around the world or, or, or low-income people, if we aggregate. And we've seen this happen, right? where people have gone in Australia, for example, when the government, government wanted to do the biggest uh, coal mine in Australian history in 2015. A coalition emerged, they mobilized people, they went to the banks every Saturday over a period of time and said, you will not lend to the destruction of our children's future. And all four Australian banks said, no, we won't do it. There's lots of ways that people can be involved. And we hear a lot about a just transition from away from fossil fuels needs to include communities, lots of talk, deliberation, consultation with indigenous people. That sounds slow. What's the tension between speed and inclusion, what it means getting off fossil fuels? Are those things in tension, inclusion and speed? So we need to be able to do both. We need to include people, and we need to move much faster than we're moving right now. If we think we can move, um, if we think we're going to move faster by excluding people and so on, then we are making the wrong calculation because those people that have been excluded are going to hold you back. But I hear Al Gore say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yes. No. You know, this is an African wisdom which I'll go always use, and I welcome the use of it. The scale of the changes that we need to make to address the climate crisis requires a level of participation by ordinary human beings on this planet on a scale that we have never seen. And that doesn't mean we cannot move fast in doing that, right? Let, let's take the just transition, which you, you should speak about. So if we are wanting to get the trade union movement to be a key partner in the fight on climate justice, which has been a big challenge. Labor unions love building fossil fuel pipelines and love building but, refineries. But, but you see, if I look at where unions were 20 years ago and where unions are today, mm -hmm. it's another story altogether. And we have to acknowledge it. But, and I think the time is right now to... Although a lot of clean energy jobs are not unionized, there's still tension. Yeah, of course, th th there is a tension. Let, let me just tell you a, a thing that might shock you. The most powerful one-liner on climate doesn't come from an environmentalist, comes from a trade union leader. At the 20, Rio Plus 20 conference, 20 years after the first climate conference, I find myself sitting with 14 civil society leaders, including the head of the global trade union movement, Sharon Barrows, in Rio, waiting to go see Ban Ki-moon to, to, you know. And Sharon is almost as naughty as I am, so, she, so, she, so we were looking at each other's notes, and she sort of suggested, hey, why don't you use my notes in the meeting with Ban Ki-moon, and I'll use your notes. <laughs> and so there she was, as a trade unionist, speaking so strongly on climate change. You can see Bua Ban Ki-moon is confused. He's like, why is this trade union lady banging on about climate? <laughs> and, then, and then she says, Secretary General, you might wonder why me as a trade unionist who has to focus on decent work, decent working conditions, and decent compensation, I am so concerned about the climate. And she said, because as a human being, as a trade unionist, and as a mother, I realize there are no jobs on a dead planet. There are no jobs on a dead planet. And I can tell you, the whole room froze in a way that nothing that could have come out of my mouth could have actually done that. The biggest problem in the world, with disease we face, is not COVID or any other disease, but it's a disease we can call affluenza. 
And affluenza is a pathological illness where humanity has come to believe that a good, meaningful, decent life comes from more, more, and ever more material ac acquisition. And the struggle on climate change has to be a struggle to rethink consumption patterns, right? We have become children in many parts of the world about how we've become dependent on all sorts of gadgets and uh, symbols of, of, of achievement, right? When, in fact, we should be incredibly embarrassed that so few have that when so many cannot, you know, even survive. So how do you navigate yourself, your own personal complicity, you know, your own consumption, whether it's flying, et cetera? It's easy to say, like, oh, I'm not a bad person. My little bit doesn't matter. And other people can obsess and get so hung up on tiny, tiny little things that they become paralyzed with their micro actions and they're weighed down and, and can't see the bigger picture. When I was at Greenpeace, I used to get this question a lot because evidently when I was at Greenpeace, I was one of the people that traveled most in the world, I was told. Aha, uh -huh. uh, hypocrite. Yeah, yeah. And, and so my response to that is, yeah, it's a reality. Right? If you take the entire budget of Greenpeace at that time, and Greenpeace is big compared to NG, you know, NGOs normally, about, at that stage, about 300 million euro in global budget, right? And I'm up against... 20 fossil fuel company leaders, right? right, who are flying in private jets to go to climate negotiations and so on, right? And when we look at just Shell, take one company, their marketing budget, that our entire 400 million is not even 10% of the marketing budget. I was never going to be apologetic about using the only means of transportation sometimes that we had available to us to go and take on those CEOs of those fossil fuel companies. And so it's not, I mean, it's not like uh, I'm traveling, you know, lavish holidays on planes and so on. And, and you know, I made choices and, I, you know, you can check it out. I live, I live in a very poor community in South Africa. Yeah, I understand CEOs, but how about rank and file workers? Because a lot of people here work for fossil fuel companies and see, hear environmentalists talk like, oh, you hate me, you think I'm bad, I'm a bad person because I, I you know, am working to provide energy that yeah. everybody uses every day. So you, can you parse the villainization of fossil fuel interests? Do, and can you summon empathy for rank and file workers who are in West Virginia or Nigeria? Yeah, yeah. So at the Paris climate negotiations in 2015, I shocked some journalists when I said, the men and women who work in the fossil fuel industry are our brothers and sisters, right? They are not our enemies. That's not an applause line right? at an environmental rally yeah, yeah. in Paris. Yeah, no, no. People got very, what is he going to say now? But thankfully, I say enough crazy things that people are used to it. <laughs> so so <clears throat> I said, many of the men and women at a rank and file level who work were told by their governments, by society, you are providing a critical service to make sure this, this country runs. They want to provide energy. They don't particularly want to provide dirty energy, but they have not been given the option. How do you say, answer the question, is it too late? Hey. <laughs> this one... So, okay, so, so what I, this is my line. But... I must confess to you, not every morning when I wake up, I feel I can say it as confidently as I'm going to say it to you now. The reality is we still have a small window of opportunity. So long as that window is open, we need to keep our optimistic take on it, right? And, but that window of opportunity is closing and fast closing. But we have to believe that humanity can rise to the challenge and broaden that window and turn things around. But and the, good things are happening. Yeah, and as you and others point out, it's happening too slow. So, yes, the main sort of rallying call that I'm promoting everywhere and all the movements that I'm part of, where I say that in the moment of history that we find ourselves in, pessimism is a luxury we simply cannot afford. And the pessimism that justifiably arises from our analysis, our observation, and our lived experience can, must, and should 
be overcome by the optimism of our thought, our action, and our courage. However, why don't you just say we left it too late and now we should just be thinking about how we survive? And then I say, well, that's not going to help us find the solutions necessarily, but let me just say, let me agree with you that it is too late. There are times that I genuinely feel that. And for some people, it's... it's oh, of it's, course, for not, the, the, the 500 people that died in Durban two years ago in my home city, of course it was too late for them. For a lot of people, right? it is, yeah. So, and I say this, assuming you're right, and we're all going down, I refuse to accept that those that brought us to this point will not be named, shamed, and held accountable for what they did to us. For those that didn't listen, for those like the Chevron, Texaco, and all these other companies, when their scientists were telling them about the dangers of fossil fuels before the IPCC and the United Nations were saying, and they were building their rigs higher in the oceans and so on because yeah. they, they, they were, were taking into account they were but, the, but publicly, they were spending hundreds of millions saying, oh, this is just a joke, right? And so when I say, I said, if we're going down, let's not go down without a fight, right? Let those that brought us to this point be held accountable. And if human life ever were to emerge again from this planet, then hopefully they, we can learn from that. Interest. And, so, and young people like the idea because it's hard for young people to find optimism in this current moment, right? Young people are getting more confrontational, throwing soup on paintings, disrupting democratic politicians. What do you think when you see people gluing themselves to streets, disrupting people who would formerly considered allies, moderate Democrats, making us all feel uncomfortable? Is that effective? Before I comment on some acts of civil disobedience by the very small number of people in relative terms globally, it's important that we actually name and identify the violence of the states, the violence of corporations, and what they are doing, right? They are destroying all efforts. <clears throat> right now, one of the worst statistics I can give you is 10 years ago, an organization called Global Witness, who does some really good work, yeah. they were measuring that we were losing two environmental activists every week, mm. right? They now, the latest reports, we are losing four activists every single week, nameless to many, hidden from the view of the media or ignored, uh, but that's the reality. So having said that, activism has to also be looking at ourselves and always saying, how can we be better? How can we shift people? How do we bring people on our side? And yeah, I think that, you know, let's take civil disobedience, which is what you focus on. Civil disobedience is one ex extremely important tool in the struggle for justice toolbox, right? Historically, if what we know is that when people face terrible injustices or challenge. It was only when decent women and men stood up and said, enough is enough. I'm prepared to go to prison. I'm prepared to give my life if necessary. That change came. And that's the moment where we are. However, having said that, you know, civil disobedience is a very contextual thing, right? And like any tool, you have to use it strategically. And if you overuse it, it can also get blunted. So let me ask you a question here. How many of you know what's mooning? Mooning? Okay, so mooning, okay, most of you don't know. I, I never thought I would be educating Americans on mooning, <laughs> but let me, let me try. So mooning is if, say, 10 of us wanted to make a poster saying stop climate change, but we couldn't get our posters into the meeting, we would each paint one letter on our bum cheek, and then we'll pull our pants down, turn around, and they'll say stop climate change. Now, that might be super effective in New York and in San Francisco as a strategy. It might not work that well in Saudi Arabia or Indonesia, for example. <laughs> probably, right? yeah. Or, 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 probably, yeah. Or for that matter, Montana. Right? <laughs> but yeah. we have to give Montana credit for having <laughs> got that good legal decision. So it's the privileged elites of our society in the media and so on went bonkers about it. But they control the media. And therefore, I'll just end by saying why programs like this are so important, like Climate One, 
is our biggest challenge we face. It's not whether we got the right policies and the right, uh, you know, specific technical strategies. The biggest problem we have is that we have a media environment that we operate in, like the United States, where half the people, or close to half the people, get one reality from Fox, Newsmax, and right-wing uh, talk radio, and the others get a different perspective. You're now writing a book, Reflections of a Failed Activist. What are your greatest failures and successes? So, firstly, I just want to say, right, had all those that have been part of the world of activism not done what they did, whichever place you were, whether you were at the YMCA or whether you were at Greenpeace or Amnesty, had all of that not happened, the world would be in a much... It would have been time up for climate. Long time ago, we would have lost on climate. So I, I just want to start by saying... So we've made a lot of progress. Some progress. Not enough, but yeah. we've definitely made some. Well, I don't know whether I would put it as strongly as that. I would say that we, 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 we've been holding the wall from crushing us. Okay. Right? We've been pushing the wall back, and we've held and contained it a bit. But I cannot tell you how much of time we have all spent in what young people now dismiss as handshake activism. You know, going in good faith and meeting with UN bodies, CEOs of big companies. Uh, and, and, you know, it was a ritualistic exercise. What would happen was, I would go into, like say if I was meeting with the president of Afghanistan, for example. When I go into that meeting, I pretty much know what he's going to say to me. He pretty much knows what I'm going to say to him. Right? He ticks off a box, civil society consulted. I tick off a box, government advocated upon. <laughs> and nothing changes. Right? Now I'm, listen, so I'm, I'm caricaturing here. Right? I'm not saying as a principle we should never engage with government and business. But at some point, we have to look at what's the return on that investment, and it doesn't look good at all. Right? And so, so I don't know the answers to what the solution is. Right? But I do know that all struggles are dependent on the participation of people who are impacted. Thanks, Kumi, for joining us. And thanks, you all. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.